Um, just quickly, uh, in, in a couple sentences, how would you define cultural appropriation? So I think there's a few different options. We can talk about cultural appropriation in terms of property rights, um, in terms of one individual uh, owning some innovation or creation that they have made. Um, this is how we think about intellectual property rights. Someone thinks of something or has some style. Um, it's theirs. They should be able to control it and make money from it. Um, that's why we have patents. And then if someone else comes along and starts doing it without their permission, then you've got um, a violation of someone's ownership of, of that idea or that style, that product. Um, that's the model that we have when we think mainly about what it means to have property in society. That's the, the dominant model. That model doesn't work for um, different types of intangible cultural heritage. Um, when we're talking about cultural property, we're talking about things where a community will be in a constant process of negotiating uh, what that uh, what that practice might be, or what that object might mean. That means that when we talk about cultural appropriation, um, probably the default mode is to think that one community has property, a fixed type of property, and then another community steals that property or steals the value from that property. In some cases, that is literally the case. Um, <laughs> well, that's, that's literally what is happening. So some types of cultural appropriation um, will be about uh, taking something that uh, is producing value for a community, um, some particular um, some particular technique, and that's really important to the livelihoods of people in that community. And then another community just steals that technique, is able to produce it on a much larger scale, um, is able to commodify it in a way that's that's well beyond what the original community was able to do, and therefore they're actually stealing a, a source of potential value and revenue for a community. So I think there's a version of cultural appropriation that's a really important one that's about um, that's about the kind of intangible property or innovation or creativity that a community might have and the fact that they should be able to ultimately benefit and prosper from that um, in the first instance before any, any other involvement from other players. Um, one problem with that model of, of cultural appropriation, um, although that, that's certainly not the only model, um, is that cultural practices themselves change in, in meaning over time, right? So, um, and in fact, this is one of the things that certain types of appropriation can do. So, for example, if there is a uh, fetishized notion of what um, an Aboriginal dot painting should look like and what it means. This, this happens a lot in tourist industries in Australia, right? There'll be a certain type of um, way of arranging dots that will then be put on t-shirts and be put on fake boomerangs and be put on postcards. Um, and we can think in the first instance there's an economic problem. There's a problem that the people who've come up with that idea, um, sorry, well that, that set of practices and techniques for dot paintings, that that's a whole set of community practices um, that have required a lot of work and then some other people are making a cheap buck off it. So that's, that's one problem. But the other problem is that it actually freezes in time what that practice is for that community because all communities are constantly changing in terms of their cultural meanings, right? So there are many different painting techniques that, um, that constantly change within Aboriginal communities and this is about internal negotiation, dissemination of new skills, refinement of different skills, different sorts of innovations. Um, if that, uh, one of the problems with the commercialization of certain cultural practices and the appropriation of them can actually be kind of freezing and limiting what those meanings might be. So I guess when I think about cultural appropriation, I think both um, both in terms of how do different communities make money out of culture and what is the capacity for a community to benefit from the work that it's done. But I also think maybe at that symbolic level um, that there's almost a, a kind of violence that is done to a community where it's got its own internal set of conversations about what a practice means and how that practice will be changed and enhanced over time um, to suit contemporary conditions. Cool. So, um, what do you consider to be the difference between appreciation and appropriation? I mean, I think that often appropriation is just appreciation and I don't think that... Um, I think if you have a critique of appropriation that does not involve demonstrating that, that person doesn't properly appreciate in that I don't think that I don't think that saying someone genuinely appreciates something 
gets rid of the political problems. I think you can both acknowledge that someone genuinely appreciates a, a, a particular item or a particular practice. You could say, yes, they genuinely love it. Um, that still doesn't fix the relationship, the relationships between communities and particularly the power relationships between communities that enable certain practices or certain objects to become uh, widely popular within a dominant cultural group um, in such a way that it could be disempowering for um, or even kind of trivialising the, the culture of another group. Um, so for, for me, probably um, appropriation versus appreciation, both of those terms are really located at the level of the individual. That's, that's a, a way of proceeding which is thinking, is this individual uh, you know, a nice person who thinks kindly of this other cultural group? You know, if I'm not part of a cultural group but I really like the way that uh, a group does their hair and I want to do my hair in that way, well, you know, there could be an individual conversation about what is the nature of my attitude towards that group. Um, I don't necessarily think that's the most important question. Um, I think the most important question is uh, the, collective, the collective capacity of groups to retain and control cultural means. If, if you're in a dominant cultural group, then uh, you have a whole lot of places in society or places in your city or the place that you live um, that can consolidate your sense of your cultural identity, right? So in Australia, there are all sorts of things that um, symbolise uh, a certain sort of white British identity and to a slightly lesser extent, white European identities. And so you can sort of walk around the street um, and you can look at what's happening in politics and you can look at the TV and you'll be able to see a whole lot of things that reinforce a kind of white Britishness. Um, and so if there's some bits of that that um, are frayed at the edges or blurred at the edges, that doesn't really affect your, your capacity to retain that identity. Um, but thinking of what happens at the level of a group, if you're in a marginalised group, then you might not have physical places or institutions that are, are able to preserve um, or maintain or refresh and replenish your, your cultural identity. Often that work has to be done through particular objects or particular memories or particular stories or particular practices, right? There's what the UNESCO calls intangible cultural heritage, the things that um, the things that hold communities together through constant um, constant community work. Um, and in that, that context, then it really matters that particular practices need, the, the meanings and the histories between those practices need to be preserved, or the meanings and histories between a particular object might be things that your grandparents or your grand, great-grandparents knew. And in order to maintain, there needs to be a constant practice of, of remembering what these things mean for that community. So in that context, I think someone from outside of that community can appreciate it um, and might, uh, th might think, oh, this is, this is very lovely, I love this song, or I love this item of clothing, <laughs> or um, I love doing this ritual with other people. Um, but then thinking, are there ways in which a majority group uh, drawing on that object or drawing on that style actually endangers the capacity of that other community to retain the memory of that practice and, and retain a sense of what that practice is actually meant to do. Um, so, so in that context, I think, I think there's a huge amount of appreciation that happens that unfortunately is not informed by someone critically understanding whether they, what their relationship is to a community that they're not part of. Um, yeah. Um, do you feel society has become more or less aware of the effects of cultural appropriation recently with things like social media? Or... I mean, I think absolutely through social media, through, I mean, there's just a constant, um, a constant slew of um, articles that will appear from uh, different magazines online, um, certainly on BuzzFeed. There's a constant set of conversations about cultural appropriation. Often those conversations about cultural appropriation, I think... Um, the most limited version can probably be, is this cultural appropriation or not? Um, and that will happen with some high profile incidents. Often those conversations, I think, are maybe overly focused on a particular individual. You know, at that point in time, did that individual know that, that what they were doing was not that great? Um, and sure, sometimes those, those debates about individuals are a good entry point. Um, I think that one of the conversations that doesn't happen so much uh, are the conversations that are about the longer history of 
who produces different sorts of cultural goods and the control over uh, production processes. And so I think that, for example, there within fashion, I think it's probably the easiest version of that conversation is should an individual who's not part of the community um, be able to wear clothing that's identified with that community? Um, that can often be about a whole lot of things around what's happening in the particular city or suburb or environment that that person is in. I think there's a lot more awareness around that um, than there used to be. And there's probably just a lot more cautiousness when people start to encounter cultural objects that are not from their own their own community. I think that there is now a sense that one needs to be cautious um, and diligent, um, or at least there are some online spaces where that's that's now the conversation. I think a much harder conversation actually now is the conversation about what sorts of genuine transformations can be made, especially within something like the fashion industry. Genuine transformations in the labouring conditions of people who are producing goods, and within that, you know, say in textiles industries, within that, um, sometimes it's very obvious that the production of certain sorts of goods by exploited communities will look like cultural appropriation. Sometimes it's a matter of buying things very, very cheap from a community that's very disempowered, and then that thing becoming cool, but not doing anything extra for that community. In, in other contexts, it is about communities or, or people who are labouring in those industries um, who might be producing goods where there's no, there's no traces of the history of where those goods were made or where that clothing was made, but, but where it made really matters, where, where it was made really matters. So I think um, there's been a lot of conversations, particularly around women working in textiles factories in India, in Bangladesh. Sometimes, of course, there's appropriation of of um, South Asian uh, style and fashion in, in Australia and that appropriation, we've got more tools to talk about that and that conversation happens more often. I still don't think the conversation happens often enough about the plain white t-shirt that's produced <laughs> in Bangladesh um, you know, at a, at a very, very small price uh, from a labourer who has no protection over their working conditions. And then when it leaves that environment, we don't think of it as a Bangladeshi item of clothing but maybe we should. Maybe we should actually be thinking mm. all of our clothing is marked by dynamics of cultural power. Sometimes we can read that off the clothing and sometimes we can't. Mm. Maybe that the contemporary conversation about symbolic appropriation and the, raise, the heightened aware of, awareness of that is useful because then we start thinking about what these industries do and why they do what they do. Um, but it's got to lead to some analysis of, of labour practices ultimately shaping what we put on our bodies. Mm. Um, so where do you come across cultural appropriation most in fashion? Most in the fashion world? Yeah. Um, so I guess when I think about the think about the places where it's most obvious that the types of fashion that people are wearing is linked to a set of cultural identities that gives that fashion some enhanced meaning, some, um, some extra meaning that isn't just that this item of clothing is a good fit or a good colour. Um, I guess I think about youth culture and I think about probably about hip hop culture in particular as having a really important set of influences on what people perceive to be cool, what people perceive to be urban, what people perceive to be edgy. Um, I think in Australia there's a really interesting set of dynamics around hip-hop culture in fashion, right? So particular sorts of sneakers, particular sorts of jeans and jackets um, that will be coming out of the intersection between African-American style and fashion in the United States um, and the way that that overlaps with sports fashion and so on. So there's a whole bunch of things that sort of have come together to produce hip-hop fashion. I guess I think it's interesting because it's one of those conversations where in the US context that type of fashion is really clearly coded as kind of black style or black cool um, and there's a lot of consciousness that when people who are not from those communities engage in that fashion then are they, are they engaging in it because they're actually into hip hop or hip hop culture or is it that um, it's people trading on all of the cool extra meanings that blackness might have under certain circumstances in the United States. So that's like a, a conversation that happens because it's also about how do people think about their identities and where does racism, where, do, where does racial segregation enter in. In Australia, I think that's actually, um, that can be a slightly different type of conversation. 
um, because things like hip hop fashion have also circulated through South Korea, through mainland China, through a whole lot of other places in the world where it's been given a different set of spins um, and often linked to countries where there's a lot of manufacturing for those exact sorts of items, for, um, for different sorts of sneakers and jeans and jackets and caps and so on. Um, countries where those things are actually being made might have their own circuits of distribution, uh, their set of meanings around that fashion. Um, and so I think that when I walk down the street on Sydney, in Sydney, you can see the one item of clothing you can see, you know, like some bling sneakers that have like gold on them and are shiny <laughs> and exciting. And you think, where is this coming from? Is this coming from someone having a relationship to, um, to some of the things that are seen to be cool about um, hip hop culture in the United States? Is it about someone, is it about the way that that's been mass manufactured and branded in Australia to be a type of coolness that's slightly evacuated or emptied out of the original meanings it might have had? Or is it something that's linked to a whole other different sort of circuit, um, like the way that certain sorts of um, fashions, um, say being, being manufactured in Shenzhen in mainland China, become very cool because they're rip-off brands of some very famous brand and then they become cool because people start to know that you're wearing something that was very expensive and is now very cheap and has a different set of meanings attached to it. So in terms of something like cultural appropriation and, and being able to read that when you're walking down the street, um, I think a few things probably need to be kept in play. They need to be a sense of, one, what sorts of understandings do people have of the history of the clothing that they wear? Um, and that understanding needs to be an understanding of the cultural groups that have developed or refined a style, but also the ways in which that clothing has been manufactured and who controls that manufacturing process. If that item is cheap, then probably it's cheap because some people somewhere are not getting paid very much to make it or not working in good conditions. Um, so I think thinking about that for you know whether I'm seeing cultural appropriation is often thinking, um, who, who knows how they wear or why they wear what they wear, what is the history of that thing? Um, and what relationship does that individual who buys that item of clothing have to the communities that have produced it, both in terms of the symbolic production of style and the, the material production of those goods? Um, so that would, be, that would be an example where I think that hip hop is one of the most discussed examples, but also involves some of the most complexity in terms of geographically, like where you are matters. <laughs> Um, so that would be one response to that question.